so we have started uh, discussion on designing of a simple CPU and the CPU architecture that we have uh, considered is like this having only two registers R1 and R2 in addition to accumulator and data <coughs> register. It is having an ALU program counter, instruction register, instruction decoder, timing and control unit and a memory address register. And for designing this CPU, we have considered few instructions on which, around which this CPU will be designed. And the instructions that we have said is like this. It is having an add instruction, add R1, then complement, and logical instruction, and R1, one jump instruction, and few move instructions. Okay. Then we have seen that the block diagram of the timing and control unit of this particular CPU will be something like this. From the instruction register, the instruction opcode will go to the instruction decoder. Similarly, we have a sequence counter to generate different time states of the CPU. The counter output is again going to a decoder. All the decoder outputs, that is sequence counter decoder output, and the instruction <coughs> decoder output, they are going to the timing and control unit. And the timing and control circuit will generate the uh, timing clock in the sequence that is required. So for that, instead of taking the entire instruction set that we are considering, we have uh, tried to see that how the timing and control circuit can be designed with respect to these three instructions, that is add R1, move R1, R2, and move accumulator, memory. So till last class, we have considered only the first instruction, that is the add instruction. And we have said that for execution of any of the instructions, few operations like opcode fetch that is common, and the opcode fetch and the decoding that takes place during the time states, machine states T0, T1, and T2. So for execution of any instruction, the operation during T0, T1, and T2 will remain the same. Okay, so that is a, those are the common micro operations which are to be there for execution of any of the instructions. After that, T3 onwards, the operations, the micro operations are different for different instructions. So for add R1, during T3, the operations that are to be performed is transferring the content of R1 <coughs> to data register because as per our architecture, CPU architecture, addition directly on R1 is not possible because R1 does not provide any input to the ALU. ALU gets input from the data register. So for addition operation, add R1, the data from R1 has to be transferred to the data register. After that, the content of data register can be added with the accumulator. And after addition operation is complete, the accumulator output has to be loaded back into the accumulator. Okay? So this is the operation that will be performed during the uh, while execution of add R1 instruction. And we are trying to develop the control logic for performing these operations. So the control logic we are developing was something like this. We have said that during T0, T1, and T2, the operations for all the instructions are common. Okay. So during T0, the operation was content of the program counter has go to the memory address register. So output enable of the program counter it has to be activated during machine state T0. Okay. Then memory address register that has to get the input during T0 and also during T2 when the operand address part of the instruction, that is IR0 to 11, the lower 12 bits, will be transferred from the instruction register to memory address register. So during T2, again, the data has to be loaded into memory address register. So the load control signal till now gets the logic of T0 plus T2. Instruction register, that instruction code is loaded into instruction register during T1. Okay, so the instruction register load input has to be active during T1 and the instruction register output enable 
also has to be active during time during machine state T 2, because during that time the operand address part of the instruction will be loaded into memory address register. So, you find that load input of the memory address register that is active during T 2, similarly the output enable of the instruction register that is also enabled during T 2. Okay. So, because these two are activated simultaneously, the output from the instruction register the lower 12 bits will be loaded into memory address register. Okay. Then for performing the add operation add R 1, we have said that because this is a register uh, reference instruction, so the decoder output instruction decoder output D 7 will be high. Okay. So, if D 7 is high, then during time interval T 3, what you have to do is we have to transfer the data from the data register from the register R 1 to the data register. Okay. So, that is why D, if D 7 is high, referring that it is a register reference instruction okay, and I 0 that is the least significant bit of the instruction register. We have said that for register reference instructions, the operand fields identify that what register reference instruction it is. And we have said that if I 0 is high, then it is add R 1 operation. Okay. So, during T 3, if D 7 is high and I 0 is high, then data will be transferred from <coughs> register R 1 to data register. Okay. So, the output enable of R 1 must be active if this condition is true. Similarly, the load input of the data register also must be active if the same condition is true. So, the same logic goes to the load input of the data register, it also goes to the output enable of the register R 1. Okay. Now, in addition to this, for performing the addition operation, you find that during time interval T 4, accumulator will get the output of the ALU. And because this is add operation, so ALU has to perform the addition operation. Okay. And among the arithmetic logical operation, we have assumed that we have only two operations, one is add, other one is and, and the other operation that has to be performed on the accumulator is the complementation of the accumulator for which we will assume that ALU will not be needed. Q bar output of the accumulator can be, uh, can be fed back to the D input of the accumulator. So, by using a single clock pulse by within the same machine state, the accumulator complementation can be performed. So, ALU will be involved for performing only two operations, one is add operation, the other one is and operation. Okay. So, in the simplest case, we will assume that ALU will also have two mode select inputs, one corresponding to add, the other one corresponding to and. So, whenever the ALU has to perform the add operation, the add mode select input of the ALU will be active. When it performs AND operation, the AND mode select input of the ALU will be active. Okay. So, accordingly for performing this AD operation coming to the control signal needed for the accumulator, what we need is accumulator has to have a load input. So, for the accumulator, we will have a load input because the result after addition will be loaded into the accumulator and that is to be performed during the time state T 4. Okay. So, this load input of the accumulator will be active during T 4 when D 7 is active okay. because this is register reference operation and I 0 is high. So, that is an add operation. ALU load input may be active in other cases as well. So, I will put it as OR logic. Okay. Similarly, for ALU, I have to have the mode select inputs. I assume that for ADD <coughs> operation, I have the mode select input called ADD. Okay. This also has to be active during T 4, if D 7 is high and 
I zero is high. Okay. So with the help of these control signals, I can perform the add operation. Okay. Now there is one more operation that is uh, uh, quite obvious. That is, end, at the end of each of these time periods, uh, machine states the sequence counter has to be incremented by 1. Okay. So, for that we have an increment input of the sequence counter. Okay. So, the other unit that is involved in the timing and control is sequence counter sequence counter is having an increment output. Okay. When this increment output will be active, it has to be active during T0 because after T0, the machine state has to go to T1. It also has to be active during T1 because after T1, the machine will go to T2. It also has to be active during T2 because after T2, the machine has to go to T3. It also has to be active during T3 because after T3 it will go to T4. Okay. Now, let me do one thing. Let me not put T3 right now. We will come to that later. Okay. For the time being, let it be here. The sequence counter also has a control input called clear. Okay. So, after completion of execution of any instruction, the machine has to go back to time state T0 when it will be ready for fetching the ne next instruction. Okay. So, for that, the clear input has to be active. Now, with respect to this add operation, you find that at the end of machine state T4, we have to bring back the machine state to T0. Okay. So, this clear input has to be active if during T4, if D7 is high and I0 is also high. It will be cleared in other situations also, so we will put this as OR logic. Okay. So, with the help of this, whatever is the control signal required for performing add operation, that control logic has been done. Okay. After doing this, let us take the next instruction that is move R1, R2. Okay. When R1 content of R2 has to be transferred to register R1 and we have seen that this operation can be performed in only one machine state that is during time state T3. Okay. And the control signals that is required for performing this operation is output enable of R2 and load input of R1. Okay. So, we take register R2 we take the output enable of register R2. Okay. And for move R1 comma R2 what is the code? Let us see. Yeah. This is what we have assumed for move R1 comma R2. That means it is also a register reference instruction. All the operations have been performed within the register. And the I3 bit of the instruction register has to be high. That means, for this instruction, we have to have the opcode as 1, 1, 1. That means, D7 output will be high and the bit I3 will also be high. Okay. So, for output enable for register R2, we must have this condition to be true. During T3, D7 is high and I3 is also high. Okay. 
and during the same interval the load input of register R1 also has to be active because the data has to go from register R2 to register R1. So, for that what we need is the load input of register R1. Yeah, R1 have we considered till now? No. So, for register R1 we have to consider the load input. Right? So, load input also has to be active if this condition is true load of register R1. So, we have to have T3 D7 and I3. Okay. So, if we set these conditions true, then data will be transferred from register R2 to register R1. Okay. Now, in addition to this, what are the other things that we have to consider? For the sequence counter, the clear input also has to be active if this condition is true, because after T3, the sequence counter has to generate machine state T0. So, for the clear input, we must have T3, D7 and I3. Okay. So, clear becomes T4, D7, I0 or T3, D7, I3. Okay. Now, here you find that for sequence counter, I put a question mark that whether we should put T3 also here or not. In this case, during after T3, the sequence counter has to be cleared. It is not to be incremented to T4. Okay. So, I have to set what will be the increment logic for the sequence counter. Okay. So, sequence counter will be incremented after T3 for an add operation. Okay. So, for that what was the logic? T3, D7 and I0. So, I will put it as T3, D7 and I0. Okay. Again, the situation may arise in other cases, so I will put all of them as OR logic. Okay. So, with this, I can complete the execution of move R1, R2 statement. Okay. Coming to the next statement that we are considering, that is move accumulator, comma M, that is reading the data from a location in memory and loading that data into accumulator. Okay. So, for that we need memory address from which location in the memory the data has to be read and you see that during time interval T2, we have already put the operand address into memory address register and this operand address has come from the instruction register. So, whatever location that has to be read and the data has to be put into the accumulator, the address of that location is already available in the memory address register. Okay. So, we do not have to perform any extra operation for that purpose. Right. So, what we have to do is, we have to simply generate the memory read control signal okay, and we have to generate the accumulator load control signal during time interval T3 if it is a memory read operation. Okay. And whether it is a memory read operation or not, that you will note from the decoder output, from the instruction decoder output. Okay. So, for this, our instruction decoder output was 001, which is the instruction for move accumulator comma memory. Okay. So, our logic will be that during machine state T3, if the decoder output 1 is active, then what operations we have to perform? We have to generate the memory read control signal, we have to generate or activate the load control signal of the accumulator. Okay. So, I will consider this, I will put say memory M, for M I need the control signal memory read, I will put it as M R 
So, m r will be active if during time state t 3, if d 1 is high, right. Similarly, for the accumulator, the load input will be active, the load control signal will be active during T 3, if D 1 is high. Okay. I can also have other conditions. So, let us put this as odd logic. Okay. So, this completes our memory read operation. Now, again in memory read operation, after time state T 3, the sequence counter has to be cleared. Right. So, for clearing sequence counter, here I have to have the same logic that is T 3 D 1. I can have other conditions as well. So, I put this as all logic. Okay. So, with this I can transfer the content of the addressed memory location to accumulator <coughs> and after that transfer is complete, the sequence counter will be cleared to 0, generating the next machine state as T 0 when it is ready for fetching the next instruction. Okay. Now, this memory read also has to be active for instruction fetch. Okay. And that has to be done when we have put the instruction opcode into the instruction register during time state T 1. Okay. So, irrespective of the instruction during time state T 1, we have to generate the memory read control signal. Because the, this is also reading a location of the memory and loading the content into the instruction register. So, memory read also has to be active during time state T 1 and there may be other conditions as well. Okay. So, you find that following this kind of logic after analyzing each and every instruction that what are the micro operations that are involved in the instruction and in which sequence the micro operations are to be performed. Okay. I can generate the control signals accordingly. Right. So, once I get the logic for each of these control signals, I simply put this logic design a combinational circuit to replace this block with that combinational logic circuit. And that combinational logic circuit comes from this logical expressions. Okay. So, with that I can complete this timing and control circuit design. Yeah, sequence counter increment has to be done. Why? After T three D one, we are resetting the sequence counter. So that comes in clear input. You cannot put both clear and increment active simultaneously because this transfer of data from the memory to the accumulator is complete during T 3. So, following T 3, the machine should be ready to get the next instruction from the memory. For that, I have to generate the machine state T 0. So, that is what has been done by this clear. Is that okay? Now, you will see that in this instruction register, one bit we had left in our last class. Instead of having opcode as 4 bit opcode, we have said that our opcodes are 3 bit opcodes. 1 bit I had left. Okay. So, what I can do is this bit I can used, I can use to indicate whether the memory reference that is being performed is direct memory access or indirect memory access. Okay. Now, what is meant by indirect memory access? In case of direct memory access, we have said that whatever is there as the operand address, that 
the bit 0 to 11 in the instruction register, this gives you the operand address and for direct memory access, we have said that this operand address directly specifies the location in the memory that contains the operand. So, this points to a location in the memory that contains the data. Okay. And for this, the most significant bit in the instruction register will have a value 0. Okay. Now, for indirect address, what we will assume is for any memory reference operation, these bits from 0 to 11, which otherwise gives you the address of the operand in memory. Now, this is pointing to a memory location, something like this. this is pointing to a memory location. This memory location gives you the address of the data. This is what contains the data. Yeah. So, in case of direct address, what we have said is for a memory reference instruction, we have to have 3-bit opcode that is bit number 12, 13 and 14, this 3 bit address, uh, 3 bit opcode and the last bit indicates whether it is direct addressing or it is indirect addressing. Okay. So, if the most significant bit is 0, we say that it is a direct addressing mode. In case of direct addressing mode, whatever you have in the bit numbers 0 to 11, that is this lower 12 bits of the instruction, that gives you the address of the operand. That means, this is pointing to a particular memory location and content of that memory location is the data. Okay. And that is what we have done for this example, when we have moved, executed the instruction, move accumulator comma memory. Okay. So, in this we have assumed that whatever is the content of those lower 12 bits, that is the address of the data. And that is why we have during T3, we have transferred the content of memory pointed to by memory address register to the accumulator. Because this is the data. Right? And here our assumption is the most significant bit is 0. Right. So, in the control logic that we have performed, in the control logic we have to put one more component that is the MSB of the instruction register has to be 0. So, instruction register I15 complement has to come into that. Okay. Now, in case of indirect addressing, again this bit numbers 12, 13 and 14 they give you the opcode of the instruction. Okay. Bit number 15 is 1. Okay. So, if bit number 15 is 1 and this is a memory <coughs> reference instruction, then the addressing mode that is being used is an indirect addressing, not a direct addressing. Okay. So, for indirect addressing, whatever you have in these bits, that is bit number 0 to 11, they point to a particular memory location. Now, this memory location is not a data, but this is a pointer. That means, it is another address. Okay. So, whatever is the content of this memory location, this is the address of a memory location that contains the data. Okay. So, what should our control logic do now? 
Control logic has to find out that if this is a memory reference instruction, then it has to check whether this most significant bit is 0 or not. If the most significant bit is 0, then whatever control logic we have developed till now that is valid. Okay. If this is 1, then what we have developed is no more valid because we have to take care of this indirection. Okay. If this bit is 1, MSB is 1 and it is a memory reference instruction, then I have to get the data from this location and address of this comes from this location. Okay. So, during time interval T3, during the machine state T3, which otherwise in case uh, of during time in machine state T3, what we have done is we have transferred the content of the memory addressed by memory address register to the accumulator. Right. If this bit is 1, then we have what we have to do is we have to read the same content, but this cannot be put into the accumulator because this is not the data. The content of this we have to put to memory address register. After putting this to memory address register, we have to perform one more memory read operation and for this next memory read operation, whatever you get from the memory that can be put into the accumulator. Okay. So, for this <coughs> indirect memory transfer, let me put it as MOVI. The operands remains the same accumulator comma M. So, what is the additional operation that you have to perform? During machine state T3, previously we have read the memory and put the data into the accumulator. Now, what we have to do is you again you read the memory address coming from the memory address register okay instead of putting this into accumulator we have to put this into memory address register itself okay so i assume that i have that corresponding bit mapping <coughs> So, during T3, this is the operation that I have to perform, right. During T4, I have to perform another memory read operation and now the data will come to the accumulator. It will not go to memory address register anymore. And what is the content of memory address register now? Memory address register. That is the pointer. That is the address that has been set during T3. Okay. So, for this, our control logic has to be suitably modified. So, in earlier case, for memory read, we have assumed that during T3, if D1 is high, then we have to perform, we have to enable the memory read control signal. Memory read control signal will in any case be activated during T1 because that is an opcode fetch operation. So, it is irrespective of the instruction that we are going to execute. Okay. So, now again similarly for memory read, for the memory, how do you perform the, how do you activate the memory read control signal? Now, memory read control signal will be during T1, we have already activated this memory read plus during T3, if D7 is high, sorry D1 is high, then we have to perform memory read. Now, find that during T3, whether it is direct or indirect, in both the cases we have to read the content of the memory. Only the destination will be different. Okay. So, I simply put as T3 D1. I do not check what is the 
content of the most significant bit in the instruction register. Okay. I have to perform an additional memory read operation during T4 if the most significant bit of the instruction register is 1. Okay. So, I will put it as T4 and if the opcode is T1, not only that, if I15, the most significant bit of the instruction register is 1, then also I have to perform a memory read operation. So, this is the additional memory read operation that is required because of interaction. Okay. I may have other logics as well. So, put this as OR logic. Okay. For memory address register, I have to modify the control logic. The earlier control logic was this during T0 and T2. So, they will remain as it is. So, for memory address register the load input, the earlier conditions remain valid during T0 and also during T2 we have to activate the load input of the memory address register. Now, additional thing comes here. So, during T3, I again have to activate the load input of the memory address register if it is an indirect memory address operation. Okay. So, my condition will be during T3, if D1 is high and I15 is high. Okay. Again, I put this as all logic because there may be other conditions as well during which this memory address register has to be active. Okay. Coming back to accumulator, for accumulator, the load input earlier was during T4 if D7 is high and I0 is high. Now, this is the one that will be modified now. Okay. So, this condition remains as it is because it is a register reference in instruction and the operation was moving the data from R2 to R1. Oh, sorry, this was the operation for adding the content of R1 with accumulator and loading the data back into accumulator. So, that will remain as it is. Okay. So, for accumulator control, control the load input will be modified as the first condition we have to retain that is T4 D7 and I0. This will remain as it is. The second condition that we had put is T3 D1. Now, T3 D1 will be replaced by T3 D1 I15 complement because here the load input will be active only if it is an direct memory read operation. If it is indirect memory read operation, the data will not come to accumulator. Okay. So, I will put it as T3 D1 and I15 complement. Okay. What is the additional condition? That is during T4, the data will be loaded into accumulator if it is D1 and I15 is high. Okay. And I can have additional conditions, uh, situations when the load input of the accumulator also has to be active. So, you put all of them as all logic. Okay. So, this is for getting a data from a memory location, loading the data into accumulator. That is a memory read operation. Similarly, for a memory write operation, when transferring the data from the accumulator to a particular memory location, I can also have direct memory write operation. I can also have indirect memory read op write operation. Okay. And in such case, the control signals that will be generated is not memory read. I have to have another control signal which is memory write. Okay. So, memory write control signal also has to be 
activated accordingly. Okay. Similarly, this accumulator, whenever you transfer the data, it is a memory write operation, you have to transfer the data from the accumulator to a location in the memory. Okay. So, we have to activate the output enable of the accumulators accordingly. Okay. So, this is how by analyzing the micro operations that will be performed in while execution of every instruction. Okay. So, that analysis I have to find out that what will be the logic for each and every control signal and I have to design the circuit for generating these logics and that has to be replaced in the timing and control circuit block. Okay. Now, here you find that though the circuit is a combinational circuit, but because of the sequence counter output is also going to the timing and control circuit input, the sequences in which the control signals will be generated that is defined. Because in the timing and control circuit block, we have these inputs either T1, T2, T3. So, these are the inputs which are going to that particular block. Okay. So, these inputs guarantee that these control signals will be generated during a particular machine state only. These control signals will not be generated arbitrarily. Okay. So, I can design the timing and control circuit for a CPU given the instructions and having the knowledge of what the instructions are supposed to do. Okay. So, so far we have considered for the internal data path that all the components are capable of loading the data from the internal data path. They are also capable of sending the data to the internal data path from where they can go to the destination. Okay. And for that purpose, for each of the components, we have an output enable. Okay. So, our restriction is the output enable of only one component can be active at a time. I cannot activate the output enable of more than one component simultaneously because in that case, there will be data clash on the bus or which is called bus contention. Okay. So, this can be guaranteed in one of the two ways. I can assume that the outputs of each and every component is a tri-stated output. Okay. So, only when you give the output enable component, only when you activate the output component, output enable control signal, then only the data will move from that particular selected component to the data bus. When the output enable control signal is low, in that case, the output of that particular component will be, will go to the tie state, third state, that means high impedance state and the data from that component will not reach the data bus. Okay. So, that way we can avoid the bus contention. The second approach is, let there be number of components. The outputs of all these components goes to a multiplexer. Okay. And it is the output of the multiplexer that acts as a bus. Okay. So, now in this case, I do not need tri-stated output device, I can have multiplexer. Okay. So, this output enable signal now will be replaced by multiplexer select channel signal. Okay. So, assuming if the accumulator is connected to multiplexer input 0. So, whenever the accumulator output is to be activated, instead of activating the output enable of the multiplexer, I will properly select the select inputs. Instead of activating the output enable of the accumulator, I will properly select the select inputs of the multiplexer. So, that only the accumulator output goes to the internal data path. Okay. So, I can have one of the two ways, either we can use a multiplexer or we can have tri-stated outputs for every individual component in the CPU. Right? So, I hope with this discussion, now you know that given any CPU what the, what, and the instruction of the CPU, instruction set of the CPU, you can design that particular CPU. 
yes or no okay so with this our low level design is complete next class onwards everything will be in block diagram till last class the control and circuit uh, the control circuit unit that we have discussed that is called hardware control unit because all the control signals are generated by hardware circuit now there is another way of generating the control signals and that is called a micro programmed control unit so in case of micro programmed control unit the control signals instead of being generated by hardware circuit it is generated through software and because these control signals are generated through software this is more flexible okay so now let us see how you can generate the control signals through software so we have said during our previous discussion that uh, once you design the hardware resources within the cpu for every hardware resource you can determine that what are the control signals that will be required okay so in our hardware control unit when we have discussed we have said that during <coughs> time state t0 the operation that was performed was the memory address register gets the content of the program counter then during time interval t1 or machine state t1 what we had done is instruction register gets the value from memory whose address is in the memory address register <coughs> okay and at the same time the program counter is incremented by 1 okay and during t3 sorry t2 the content of the instruction register is decoded okay so what we do is we decode the instruction register content okay so these are the operations that were done during the machine states t0 to t2 okay and we have also said that simultaneously what we have done is we have loaded the memory address register with the lower 12 bits of the instruction <coughs> register that is supposed to hold the operand address in memory if it is a memory reference instruction okay so if i consider only these three machine states you find that the controls that are involved is for memory address register we have to have the load control input of the memory address register output enable of the program counter load instruction register read memory increment program counter load memory address register again these are identical then output enable of the instruction register okay so let us call these associate these control signals with some bits in the control memory <coughs> okay so let me say that load memory address register <coughs> load memory address register that is associated with bit number c0 that is the 0th bit in the control memory okay output enable of the program counter that is associated with <coughs> bit number 1 in the control memory or c1 then load instruction register is associated with <coughs> bit number c2 in the control memory then read control signal for memory is associated with c3 in the control memory okay then we have 
program counter increment that is associated with bit number C 4 in the control memory. Then load memory address register is already considered. Then what we need is output enable <coughs> of instruction register is associated with bit number C 5 in the control memory. <coughs> okay. The first operation that is to be performed is an opcode fetch. Okay. So, if I ensure that whenever the machine is powered on or whenever the machine is reset, the control memory address register will also be reset to 0. So, that ensures that just after switching on the machine or just after resetting the machine, the microprogram control unit will start generating control signals from the 0th location in the control memory. That means, the first control signals it will generate are C0 control signals associated with C0 and C1, which are nothing but load memory address register and output enable of the program counter. So, program <coughs> count from the program counter, the address goes to memory address register. Okay. Now, in addition to this, we also have said that every location in the control memory will have two more fields. One is the next address field, where from the next control signals are to be read and it also have a field, one bit field, which is the mode, uh, the address select field. Okay. So, I will put in along with this, in the same locations, the next address fields within the control memory address register. Okay. So, here you find that after generating these control signals, the next control signals are to be generated from the next memory location within the memory, okay, which is memory location 1. So, I put <coughs> the next memory location in few more bits. I put it as 0, 1. Right now, I am putting it <coughs> in decimal form, but this has to be coded into binary and the number of bits required in binary form that has to be used. Okay. For simplicity, I am putting this as decimal number. Right. So, after execution of this, the next address is 1 that is the this particular location in the control memory. So, after generation of these control signals, next time the control signals will be generated are C 4, C 3 and C 2 and C 4, C 3, C 2 means increment program counter, read memory and load instruction register. Okay. So, after these control signals are generated, the next control signals are to be read from the third location in the control memory. So, I again put in the next address field as 0 2. So, you find that I am putting in the decimal form. Okay. So, you find that for this simple situation move R 1 comma R 2, the micro program was a single micro instruction. So, this I can call as a micro instruction. So, it is a single micro instruction. Whereas, for execution of some other programs, maybe I need more than one micro instructions. I think we had taken some such example where you need more than one. Yeah. The example that we had taken is add one of the instructions that we had is add R 1. Okay. In add R 1, the micro operations that are to be done is during time machine state T 3, the content of R 1 has to be loaded to data register. Okay. Then during machine state T 4, accumulator is to be loaded with sum of accumulator and data register. So, that we had put in this way A L U performing add operation on accumulator and data register. Okay. 
So, for this operation I need a micro instruction and the control signals that are needed are load data register and output enable of R1. Okay. For this micro operation to be executed during machine state T4, the control signals which are required are load accumulator, okay. then we need ALU add control signal because when this control signal is made equal to 1, then only ALU will perform add operation. Simultaneously, we also need output enable of ALU <coughs> because from the ALU, output of the ALU is going to the common data path. So, I also have to active activate output enable of ALU. Okay. But does it have only advantage? Yeah, speed wise this will be slow because for ex generation of any control signal I have to read the memory content. Okay. So, because it is software in nature, it will be slower than hardware control unit. But the advantage is it is more flexible, gives flexibility while designing and the second advantage is it is more compact because the whole lot of hardware control circuit is now put in just the control memory. Okay. So, it is compact and flexible, but speed wise it will be slower. Okay, that accuracy does not matter much. Okay, so with this we take a break. <laughs>